All right, so we're going to start off with a show of hands if this is your first DC History Center program. All right, wow. we've got a good number. That's awesome. Now, a show of hands if you are a member of the DC History Center. Oh, an equally nice set of hands. So if you'd like to learn something about membership tonight, you can ask any staff member or you can ask one of your friends here tonight who is already a member. Um, but if you're new to us, we really hope you enjoy tonight's program um, and want to come back for another. So if you're not already familiar with us, the DC History Center is a community supported nonprofit uh, that was founded in 1894, so we've been around for quite a while. Our mission is to deepen understanding of our city's past to connect, empower, and inspire. Now, we do that in a number of ways, including through adult programs like tonight's program, but we also um, work through research and scholarship, youth education, exhibits, um, and you'll also find us in our library. When you're not visiting us here on site, and who else loves this beautiful building, um, you can find us online, through social media, and at dchistory.org. Now just a moment about tonight's program. Um, I want to say just a couple words. Um, across the country, gig companies like Uber in 2011 appear as solutions to, Uber pro uh, to urban problems such as underemployment, failing public transit systems, racial inequities, and anxieties about global economic competitiveness. DC was no exception. And as those of us who study DC history know, DC is even more often an example or a trendsetter in some ways. So we're going to dive a little bit more into that in tonight's program, uh, but I know you don't want to hear more of that from me. Uh, so I'll tell uh, just a couple things and hype up our speakers before we get started. So Kate Wells is a PhD geographer who studies urban change. She writes about how tech affects the way we live in cities and especially how we govern them. Currently, she's a postdoctoral fellow at Georgetown University. Declan Cullen, PhD, is Assistant Professor of Geography at George Washington University. His research focuses on political economic transitions, historical geographies of race, empire, and post-colonial development, especially in Newfoundland. And then Jaron Price is tonight's moderator. He is President and CEO of the Downtown DC Business Improvement District, otherwise known as a BID, and sits on the Board of Trustees at the DC History Center. He holds a BA in Urban Studies and an MS MBA. So with that, Jaron, the mic is yours. All right. Thank you so much, Marin, and I'm so excited to get into this conversation today. Um, again, welcome to this awesome book talk. Um, I think we are studying such a fascinating topic here, and I think there's going to be some really great uh, discussion just around the role that uh, Uber has played and really using DC as a backdrop uh, for that story. Um, one of the things that I personally love about the History Center um, is just the way that we think about history and what we can learn from it, how we relate to it, and you know, just lessons that are um, able to be driven from that that can help shape the future. Um, and so I'm kind of excited that this is a bit of a contemporary history lesson. Um, and I was saying to the uh, authors here, um, you know, I feel sort of a personal connection to this work uh, for two reasons. One, uh, my grandfather, who was a DC native, was a taxi cab driver for his entire life. And so I've always sort of thought about um, just the evolution of uh, transit and the way that Uber sort of uh, disrupted the taxi cab industry and uh, what my grandfather would think about that if he were uh, still here and uh, part of that, that network and thinking about that, uh, how it's changed society in so many ways. Um, and then secondly, um, you know, I'm here in downtown DC. Uh, the History Center is a part of our downtown DC business improvement district. Um, and we're constantly thinking about, you know, what is the evolution and future of transit rich um, communities? What does it mean to have effective uh, ways of getting around? And so when you think about these uh, big tech companies like Uber that um, have their different uh, roles and things that they play. Uh, in various cities, I'm really curious to sort of understand um, how they show up and what it means for our community. So lots to delve into here today, and I want to just immediately get into um, just the first question. Um, I think one of the interesting things about this book is even the title. Um, it's Disrupting DC, the Rise of Uber and the Fall of the City. Um, I want to just ask our authors, um, can you say a little bit about what that means? And, um, you know, we think about Uber as a disruptor in, in the industry that they're in. What does it mean to disrupt? disrupt DC, and, and can you say a little bit more about this, the provocative nature of the title? Um, absolutely. Um, we didn't choose the title, which <laughs> if you've ever tried to write a book, you'll kind of figure out slowly that like uh, a lot of what you do is um, compromise with people, about titles and covers and colors and all that kind of stuff, you know? Um, and uh, we had a, we, we like, 
Oh, well, we can refavor the title. I mean, the, the word disrupt comes out of this moment right of 2011, 2012, when um, uh, I think across the United States and everywhere else, there's like a, um, a real moment where tech companies, Silicon Valley, whoever we characterize in general, I think um, uh, they engage in the process of reshaping, you know, all these different parts of urban life and the way it's framed at the time is kind of disrupting. Um, uh, systems that weren't working well, and laws or legacies that were, or legacy regulations as one of the phrases was, that uh, um, were kind of seen as standing in the way of innovation. Right? And in many cases were, I think, as it both points out, DC is one of these kind of textbook cases. Um, so it's about this kind of nature of disrupting urban politics, disrupting the way we live. Um, and we kind of make the argument that there's lots of different ways to think about how that disruption works. Right? Um, so yeah, um, it got called Disrupting DC. We wanted to call it Low Expectations, but <laughs> like, no one's going to buy a book called Low Expectations. And they're probably right. <laughs> Good. I think you all landed on a, on a really good provocative title there. Um, so I want to ask you, you know, when you think about just the rise and fall of Uber, a lot of um, credits were given by Uber as DC being like a critical space for them and a space where they learned a lot of lessons and were able to advance a lot of their work. Um, why is DC such an important place in the overall story of Uber? Yeah, thanks for that question. DC is really important in the history of Uber, and we were somewhat surprised to learn that. Uber has held up in the early years, and now for almost more than a decade, DC as its legislative baby. It got what it wanted here because DC rolled out the red carpet. Um, and it also not only got the legislation it wanted, it was also able to test, um, what's it called, test run? What do you call it? Trial run, try out, beta test all of its racial justice arguments that it has sub, sub, uh, subsequently taken on the road, especially in California. In 2020, California had the largest ballot initiative in its history, which was $220 million spent by Uber, Lyft, and their peers to try to get a law that it liked. All of its tactics in terms of clicktivism, the idea that you, if Declan's downloaded Uber, he would get a message from Uber saying, please, text, tweet, contact your council member, your state legislature, tell them that you don't want that law. All of those things were things that it had tried out here in DC. One of my favorite stories about this sort of new model of lobbying was something that they, um, oh my gosh, for historians, you must find the irony of this. It was something that they called um, World Operation Rolling Thunder. Which, you know, of course, as American historians, you understand, refers to the U.S. bombing campaign in Vietnam. But Uber being the company it was, used that phrase to describe the way it attacked the D.C. Council's ability to pass a law that might create a base floor for workers as well as um, disability rights. Wow. One of the first things that Uber was fighting with the D.C. Council about was whether or not these new chauffeur services should have to adhere to some semblance of the American Disabilities Act. Wow. Yeah, I want to delve into that a little deeper. So, I mean, we you, you cover in the book quite a bit about just the role that local, uh, the DC's uh, city council and other local lawmakers played, um, you know, in this entire story. Um, and specifically, as we think about just the role um, the desire that lawmakers had to really brand the city as an innovation hub and seeing Uber as a, a shining example of innovation. Um, you actually argue in the book that it's not so much a sign of innovation, it's more so a sign um, of what you say is urban economic strength, I'm sorry, but urban, not urban economic strength or innovation, but instead urban weakness, desperation, and low expectations. I would love for you to explain a little bit about what that means. Why did you, why did you make that assertion in this book? I think I need to call Kathleen, our third author. I think he wrote that line. But um, absolutely. So I think like um, a very important like long-term kind of um, thought process for thinking about Uber in DC is just kind of the nature of where cities find themselves, as you're well aware of some of the works and, and, and these things, like that cities are in difficult circumstances, right? Like they face eroding tax bases, now issues with the pandemic. And so when they think about like long-term strategies for economic development, they're often kind of between a rock and a hard place. So we're hard on the city in the book, but like, you know, city officials are great and they do good work and they do their best. And, and 
and they, they face kind of straightening circumstances. And those straightening circumstances, like like the example I always use for this when I teach in classes is like, you remember the Amazon bid thing, right? It's like people, every mayor in the country had a YouTube video where they offered them their firstborn child and everything else because we need that level of development. And so, but I think part of the, 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 the point is that like cities are negotiating generally from a position of weakness, right? And so that's kind of what we're trying to get at. That um, uh, Uber offers solutions to cities, right? Um, in lieu of cities being able to do certain kinds of things. So like, you know, Metro is not working very well. Uber fills a gap. It's already, so I think one of the things we really faced when we were writing the book was like, we don't want to write a book that's like, the gig economy is bad and Uber is terrible, right? Because there are many books like that. And, um, we, we want to take seriously the idea that everybody uses it, <laughs> right? And, and that it fills an important gap in the city, right? But also to understand what's the set of conditions and context that makes the service necessary. So rather than just being an academic and complaining about everything, which we do a lot, also trying to figure out like well, what, what makes certain things necessary and viable solutions for people in real life situations. And so it's kind of a, a, a trying to answer that kind of um, broader question. Yeah, I'll just add that. The, the bottom line is that it, it's not a hit piece on Uber. It's a hit piece on all of us who got in bed with Uber. Mm. You know, I want to I probe a little bit deeper there. I think that, um, you know, you mentioned there's a lot of literature out there that does, you know, sort of make the argument Uber bad, gig economy, you know, exploitation, um, and can really make a strong argument for that. I don't know that we're here to make that argument or not, but what would you say to folks who ask, you know, is this book um, suggesting that you shouldn't use Uber, right? That Uber is not a good solution. What do you say to folks who might have that sort of uh, conclusion from having read this? Um, we actually begin our conclusion with that very question. We say, you know, at a lot of these um, conversations that we've had over the years, people say, okay, should I stop using Uber either as a worker or as a rider? And we said, no, no, no. What we want you to do is we want you to think really carefully about what are the things that would need to happen so that Uber no longer is our solution for public transit, so that Uber is no longer the solution for paratransit, so it's no longer the solution for racial justice in the consumer vein, and so it's no longer the solution for city policymakers who are struggling with questions about curbside management or congestion. We want to think about what kind of city would we need to build here in DC and across the world where Uber doesn't come in and get to set the agenda for the next decade. About that. Do you want to add anything? Uh, sure. I mean, I, I, my very abstract thought process, I totally agree, my very abstract thought process on this is like life is full of contradictions, right? And so when people ask that question, like, should I use Uber? I kind of like, well, do you need to? <laughs> um, if you need to, then that's probably okay. I mean, like, we, we have these critiques of, you know, global supply chains, but we wear clothes that are made in sweatshops on a global scale. We're in an Apple store. We're in an Apple store, yeah, right now. So, like, you know, uh, critiques are all well and good and need to be made, but at the same time, there's, like, a practical level of engagement where you have to think, like, you can't just talk to an Uber driver and say, you really should quit this. This is a bad job. Or go find another job. Like, it, it's, it's not as simple as that. Um, so I think, uh, um, but we do have like lots of optimism on how these things work, right? And some of that comes from our own work, some of that comes from talking to policymakers and drivers, and um, uh, that maybe that kind of 10 year, 15 year period of like gig economy capitalism gone wild on, that, on the global scale is kind of beginning to, we begin to kind of come to terms and think more carefully about where we are now. Um, that's kind of what the conversation we're trying to be part of, I think, with the book. Really, really appreciate it. Did you want to add more to that, Katie? I'm sorry, you looked like you were ready. You were itching to say something, so please feel free. Yeah, go ahead. I'll just say one more thing. So part of the, the beginning of this book was a longitudinal study where we followed 40 workers for five years as they moved on and off the apps. And so where we land with that question about, so should you take Uber or not, has to do with taking seriously the lives of these workers for whom Uber helps some of them make ends meet. 
You know, uh, Katie, I'm actually glad you brought that up. So I think one of the things that um, really stuck out to me as I was reading the book, you know, you all did an extensive amount of research and you talked to people on all fronts of uh, Uber, from folks who uh, work and drive, uh, folks who use uh, Uber, the lawmaking um, element of this. I, I guess my question to you would be, when you think about just the impact that it has had on people, were there any particular interviews, conversations, or uh, just stories that really resonated with you um, as you were doing this research that you thought were important to lift up? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no thanks for that. I'm going to tell you guys a story of a worker who we're going to call Diana. Um, like Jaren, she is a lifelong Washingtonian. Um, and when we met her, she was taking jobs at fast food restaurants, even though she hated the work. The managers at McDonald's and Fuddruckers, you guys still remember that one? They were willing to accommodate her schedule as a part-time student here at UDC. When she started to drive for Uber in 2016, she told us that she was enthusiastic about its potential to free her from the drudgery of fast food work. She said, quote, I love driving Uber. I set my own hours. It's stress-free. I have no boss. She wondered whether the rise of Uber, though, would endanger investments in the public transit system, which is something she had used proudly since she was eight years old. She also wondered whether Uber's presence in the city would mean fewer unionized jobs in that transit system, which is a place she could imagine one day working. As an Uber driver, she found herself, like so many others that we interviewed, cheering awkwardly against Uber. She found herself cheering on what local radio stations called the Metropocalypse. Do you guys remember that term? It was a proliferation, right, of closures, delays, track fires in 2016 that had beset the alien system. She said, quote, it's great, it's bad, because you're taking metro people out of work, but at the same time, it's gonna be a lot of rides out there, a lot of customers. I like it when metro doesn't work. Ooh. Two years later, Diana stopped working for Uber. She had graduated from college and for the first time was employed full time. She was a police officer for the DC Housing Authority, a job with a salary and some benefits. Diana told us she loved the work. Still, Diana, like many people, didn't write off the gig economy. In fact, when we interviewed her, she was effusive in her defense of it. Uber, she said, quote, helps people at their time of need. She felt this way despite running into occasional and very typical problems with the app. These were problems where she did not get paid for completed rides, problems where she incurred $1,200 worth of damage to her suspension system, which it turns out is an important part of the car. And she also incurred problems when she was sexually assaulted by a passenger. Diana was clear with us though in subsequent years. If she lost her job as a police officer or needed extra income, she would sooner go back to Uber than return to the fast food industry where her schedule was always variable and her income never reliable. And go back she did. Three years later, Diana was still employed as a police officer for the housing authority, but her salary of 53,000 no longer went far enough. Her rent had gone up, so had her bills, and now at age 29, she was a single mother. She took maternity leave as mostly unpaid time off. And to get by, she applied for food stamps and signed up to deliver for Uber Eats. When we last spoke, Diana was averaging 41 hours a week on the delivery app, in addition to the 40 hours she works at the housing authority. She does her Uber Eats delivery work on the weekends or after she finishes her other job. Her godmother or a friend watches her child. She says that meal deliveries are easier than ride hailing, which they are, where there is a threat of physical violence. Diana doesn't sleep much, and when we meet her, she drinks cup upon cup of coffee. She appreciates that she doesn't have to drive for Uber on days when she doesn't want to, but she wishes there were more stability in the platform's pay, especially in the face of inflation. A minimum wage, she said most recently to us, would be so lovely because when I think about gas and how much time it takes to drive and pick up and drop off, to have a set minimum would be great. She also wishes she could qualify for rental assistance from the city or extend her food stamp qualification, which expired when she went back to work full time after maternity leave. 
She earns too much to qualify for public assistance, but not enough to get by on an income from a single job. In the capital, let's say, of one of the wealthiest countries in the world, people like Diana should be able to survive without working 81 hours a week. And this is the important point. The fact that Diana cannot is a reminder that the reason why US workers do not earn enough to survive is also the very reason why our friend Uber is so, so popular. We do not pay people enough and do not take care of each other enough. So with this book and with Diana's story, what we want to do is we want to encourage DC residents, right, to ask what would need to change so that Diana no longer turns to Uber as her default solution. Thank you so much for sharing that um, really compelling story. And again, it just really comes alive as you're, you know, thinking about the research you all have done and just the stories that, um, you know, make up this really important book. It's it's really helpful. It just resonates deeply. So thank you for sharing that. I want to um, sort of continue down this topic of just thinking about the impact to people, right? And um, you know, one of the things that I think is it's uh, interesting to explore. Um, you, you mentioned in the book that Uber took specific efforts to try to position itself as, you know, a tool to, to fight racial injustice. It's an equalizer to create space for people to earn more money through the gig economy. Um, in some ways, and then even in the early days, I recall it being um, thought of as, as, as a, you know, way to help, uh, you know, sort of the classic case as a black male having issues hailing a cab, uh, being able to use Uber to, to access a ride could be uh, a game changer. Right, and a true, uh, uh, you know, stand in, in opposition to existing uh, racial discriminated, discriminatory barriers. Um, you mentioned in the book, you know, you all are less interested in sort of assessing how sincere that is and um, how real it is. But you know, I think the question is, you know, what can we say about what Uber represents in that realm? Has it helped in any of those regards? And you know, how do we get to this point where we are today, where it is obvious that there are also a lot of shortcomings in, in how this system has been structured? Yeah, um, it's a great question. And so we ended up kind of, when we were doing the research, this really came out very strongly. So when you read the early debates around the taxi industry, can you hear me okay? Yeah, okay. Uh, when you read the early debates around the taxi industry, you can really get the sense of just like anger, just yeah. like people just being fed up with the nature of the taxi system and like, uh, I don't discount that for a second. I mean, there's, there, when uh, when people began to submit letters and emails and so on to the DC City Council, like just uh, just thousands of like just so many accounts of you know not being able to to get a taxi, of taxis not taking people to certain neighborhoods, of um, of all the racism that's tied up with that, right? Um, and that's true, and that presents a very real problem for the city. And so we kind of have this thing where we, we constantly think about, okay, DC has a problem, and then um, uh, Uber offers a solution, and then we think about the nature of the solution and how it works. And, and part of this, of course, is that you know uh, issues in one well, we can think about issues in the transit system more generally. Um, a, a lot of workers are people of color. Same goes for taxi drivers. So it's not as simple as kind of like um, uh, one's wrong and one's right in this kind of situation. It's also kind of, we, we, we think it's very difficult to prove or show that um, Uber um, or algorithms behave in a different way than taxis do, even though it's, it is different. And at the beginning, the kind of argument was, look, the only thing that matters here is um, the color of your money. Um, and that, it, 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 the only research we've seen on it specifically dealing with like statistically quantitative analysis has been places like Chicago, which experienced very similar problems, which is that it's kind of impossible to show where this is happening. The dream was, of course, that Uber, as, as one person told us in the book, would unite the old DC and the new DC. Um, but uh, again, if we think of the broader context of DC, there's, of course, elements of that are true. There's elements that are very difficult to to prove, I and mean, then there's elements where you say, look, the changing nature of DC as a city over the last 10, 15 years has been that it's getting richer and, and wider. And that's also a context for the, you know, people having excess money to use these services. So like, it's caught up in this very thorny kind of broader um, transformation of the city that we think is worth taking very, very seriously. So, do you something to okay. so. Looks like you do. <laughs> I mean, okay, I'll say one thing. Okay, Spike Lee, right? Yay, yeah. on one hand. Okay, so he in 2000, let's say 18, 18 yeah. 
the director, Spike Lee, uh, did some videos glorifying what he called the Brooklyn hustle for Uber. And these are videos you can find on YouTube. Um, and he was making an argument, much like Uber did, that this is racial justice, that somehow a black man being able to hail a taxi is racial justice. Now, whether or not that is better, right, it doesn't acknowledge the fact that it's a very narrow version of racial justice. It doesn't consider the fact that this is a majority black workforce and also a majority migrant workforce in the US, right? And so those questions about the black worker, right, really get omitted from Uber's vision of what racial justice looks like. Yeah. You know, Spike Lee says it must be true, right? Um, no, no. Uh, it's really interesting just seeing how they were really thoughtful about how they were um, broaching that conversation. Um, I want to get back to a little bit of just the role that lawmakers and, and policymakers played, um, you know, in sort of the story of the rise of Uber here in D.C. Um, one of the common themes that keeps coming up in the book, and as I was reading through it, this theme of just common sense, right? And common sense is a, a construct and in some ways sort of became an attitude, right? Let Uber do it. It's just common sense that we'll have Uber in the mix. Can you say a little bit more about that construct and, and why did that why did that appear as such an overarching theme in the book? Yeah, I, I think I'm probably responsible for the common sense idea. Uh, it, it's just kind of it, it really is like um, kind of like ideology as a, as a concept. So like you know we come to these places where the actions we we take in any given situation appear to be common sense um, in in a in a very real way. So like. An example, um, you it actually happened to me one day. I found a neighbor, uh, an elderly gentleman, on the street, pinned under a branch. And he was lying there, and I happened by, and I was like, um, can I call an ambulance? He's like, no, God, no, don't do that. Um, call me a taxi. And I was like, look, I'll go get my car. I'll take you to the hospital. But in that moment, when you are thinking, should I call an ambulance to go to the hospital or should I get a taxi? The common sense answer is don't call an ambulance. It's too expensive. Mm. But it's also an absolutely insane answer, right? Like, as a European, you just like call it, like, you know, it's, it's, it's not going to cost you $5,000. It's just a normal thing to do. So it's kind of a, an extreme example of thinking through how is it that certain propositions just seem logical in a given situation, even though they're clearly not logical. And so that happens a lot with governance and how we think about things. And so um, if we think about, you know, privatization and governance or, you know, academics that think about things like neoliberalism and, and so on and so forth, it's like, how is it, does it change kind of just the simple things about who do we think is responsible in a given situation? Like one that I found very interesting is like people we spoke to, um, when we talked about data sharing, they said, I don't want the government to have my data. Um, I would rather a corporation had it. And I was like, oh, interesting. I just didn't see that coming. I'd probably forgotten about the previous 10 years and whether it's Snowden and all that. But uh, that to me is like a common sense proposition that I found unusual. And so it's kind of getting at that broader question. Really appreciate that. I want to dig a little deeper on the data piece. Um, one of the things that um, I even remember the early days of Uber being here in town. Um, I was working for the city at the time, but there was almost this promise that there would be a lot of data, right? Big data, data that will help us to inform decisions and make good, good and sound policy uh, decisions. Um, and so, in, in some ways, it almost became this obsession around the data that uh, rideshare companies could provide and how cities could use it. Um, and I would imagine, as a researcher, you probably like data is, is there a value to this or is there something to this data argument that is of value or was there a role that it played that was valuable yes data has been their trojan horse data is how they got we argue all of these policymakers across the world on board with their game they said, we will offer you, they even had a, they branded for a while, it was called Uber Movement. We are going to help you crack your commute. There was an argument that what Uber is, is a technology company that collects data. Now, how much data per minute, we still want to know. As an empiricist, we really wanted to find out, what is the data? What's the scope of it? How big is it? How frequent is it? What's the quality? And what we found out in DC over the five years that we tracked the 40 DC workers that we mentioned, we also followed about 35 local policymakers. And we would ask them questions like, hey, how, how's it going with that data sharing? Whoa. The questions and the frustration and the anger they had about the false promises of these companies 
um, was really palpable. And I think it's really important because what it's been able to do is create a huge barrier to governance, right? When we have all these policymakers unable to see the thing that exists within their bounds, how can you possibly evaluate whether it's good or bad, whether it needs to be you know, called in a bit or not? Um, and so I think, you know, one of the arguments that we come out at is that the data argument for Uber has been key to its success across the U.S. And the irony of this, of course, is that Uber has been arguing that it is a partner of cities at the same time that it has, for the last decade, undermined the ability of cities to govern themselves. The term we use is state preemption to talk about the way in which Uber and its peers have gone to states to preempt, to limit the ability of cities to create, let's say, minimum wage laws, or in Texas, the ability to fingerprint all drivers, right? And what is now announced last week, oh, I'm so upset, Politico announced that Uber has a new $30 million PAC in California to make sure that its state legislature there has a kind of elected officials that it wants. And we can only imagine the kind of stories that are gonna propagate it. And can anybody challenge it without the data? My goodness, no. I have a question, please. Yeah. yeah, one thing out of that, that I would say, I think about a lot. Um, so one aspect of this is for me is very interesting. Is like I think, uh, you know, Uber is representative of a broader shift in our lives over the last ten years, where we just there's reams of data about us, and we 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 datafy our lives. You know, how many steps did I take? How much like all this kind of stuff, and and the promise all is is like that. Having this data will give you some better way of analyzing or you know cracking or hacking the various kind of things we say uh, in your life. And the book is full of data, but it's full of qualitative data, which is different. I wouldn't say any worse or better. It's just a different form of data. And uh, there's there's this kind of element of of. Um, we went to give a talk at this place, uh, institute called uh, Data and Society in New York, and we were complaining about data and how can we get access to data and they won't give us the data. And someone put up their hand and was like, why do you need the data? And I was like, uh, is data good? No, we're all like, right, no, you, you, we know the problems you're facing. It's quite obvious. There's any number of ways to prove what you want to prove without the specific data you're talking about. And a lot of city officials we talked to kind of, they voice frustration at not being able to get the data. But then when they got the data, thinking like, well, now what do we do? <laughs> it's like data doesn't tell you what to do, right? It might, it'll, it'll only answer the questions you ask it effectively, right? And so sometimes I think we, we put data on this pedestal that if we get the data, we'll figure out the questions. But the questions are normative questions, right? What kind of city do you want to live in? What values do you have? And then you use the data to answer those kinds of questions, not the other way around, in, in my opinion, right? Um, and so I think sometimes that the that chapter is really dealing with not just our frustrations around data, but just our own kind of journey of trying to figure out what was going on with data and city politics in the first place, right? Not that data is not incredibly useful, it is, but I think we, we need to have much deeper conversations about what does it do and why is it useful rather than just accepting that at face value data is good. It just it, it doesn't make sense, especially someone who's a qualitative kind of person. Absolutely. No, I appreciate the thoughtfulness around that. Um, I want to touch on something you said, Katie, about the uh, spending uh, in California uh, that was reported. So lots of money being spent towards political lobbying uh, in various campaigns in California. I want to know, you know, we're here in D.C. What does that mean for us as a city? Should we be thinking about or concerned about, you know, that sort of playing a role here in the city? Um, do you think there's any, you know, anything we can infer from that in terms of just future battles we should be thinking about here in D.C. with respect to what Uber might be looking to do next? Yes. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, one of the things that we found in this book was the amount of money that Uber and its peers have invested and continue to invest in lobbying the DC Council. Um, some of our wonderful students have pulled uh, quarter, is it quarterly lobbying reports from the DC Council, um, and we can track that, and it is stunning. It, uh, the National Employment Law Project had an estimate, this is almost a decade ago in 2016, that Uber and Lyft combined their lobbying across the U.S. was more than Facebook. It was Facebook then, guys. Facebook, Apple, and Google. 
Okay, it is, Uber has to be understand. If you take anything away from tonight, please understand. It is a political project trying to undermine the idea of regulation is a common good. What it wants to do in California, what it is trying to do, oh, thanks guys. <laughs> okay, what it wants to do in California, what it has been doing in Massachusetts, in Chicago, in Georgia, across the US, Texas is a prime example. It has been trying to undermine the ability of folks to promote let's say, fair wages for workers, workers' comp, death benefits. Just yesterday in D.C., a worker was hit, um, an Uber Eats delivery worker was hit while on a bike, right? Do you think that Uber is going to pay anything? No, right? Business Insider is one of the few outlets right now that is covering what's happening to these workers. Uber celebrated having its first year of a profit, but it has come at the cost of workers. And guys, that comes at the cost of our community. The number of workers we talk to that receive public aid in the city, or let's say qualify for delivery, um, what's it called, uh, food pantry from Bread for the City is staggering. These are workers who are not earning enough to take care of their families, and it costs our city something. And so I think the battles upcoming are significant, whether it's about congestion fees, Okay, and that congestion study, let's say, that never was released yet, um, but also about what's going to happen with instant delivery in the city, um, and also our favorite topic of automated vehicles. Thank you so much. That's so much in what you said that we could unpack, and uh, you, you garnered some applause when you made the statement about uh, you know just Uber's role in trying to replace a, a common good and privatizing it. You know, there are some who would argue you know this is a public-private partnership, right? This is Uber, uh, you know, a, a tech company working with uh, the public sector to try to uh, you know solve problems and to fix something. What would you say to that? Is this is it fair to characterize it as a public-private partnership? Karen, that is totally what I thought it was when we started out, especially around questions about paratransit. We thought this was some new version of a public-private partnership where there's a joint goal. But what we found is that instead of Uber being a partner to the city to promote any of the city's goals, instead it is the opposite, where what the city has become is a partner to Uber toward its goals. Uber is not helping the city achieve its goals as far as we can tell. Now, I'm an empiricist. We're both empiricists. We like data, even if we question it. Fine, Declan. Okay. <laughs> We would love to be proven otherwise, but it has been a decade. There's plenty of other researchers out there that have found the same issue, which is that these entities cost cities tremendous. Think about the Olympics. There are things that build up cities and things that take you know, away funds. This is one of them. Declan, anything you want to add to that? You look like you were deep in thought as Katie was sharing. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, Katie, you're way more of an expert in public private partnerships than I am. So, but yeah, I, I, I agree. I mean, I think, again, the, the broader structural emergence of Uber is, is I think, really interesting, like the, where we start, the kind of straightened circumstances. And, and part of it is cities just do have less leverage now. And so um, the, the idea that, you know, cities are being listed by Uber, I think, makes a lot of sense if we think, you know, more specifically about those big shifts. And, like, one of the big shifts that, that is partly technological, so we see, like, Uber is 2009, along with all these social media companies, and it's not really coincidental. It's like a combination of two things. Like, it's workers in the wake of the Great Recession, right, needing to make ends meet, and then huge amounts of, like, you know, money floating around where investors are looking for the next big thing because the financial markets have collapsed. And, and so I think, you know, the rise of all these companies post 2008, 2009 is part of this, you know, shift that and cities are negotiating, right? Those are the people in search of work, underemployed, unemployed, however we phrase it. Um, and then this kind of, like, you know, this, this surplus money looking for places to invest in. And so I think uh, it does make sense. Cities are, you know, it's difficult stuff out there, as you all know, right? <laughs> Absolutely. No, okay, I really appreciate that. Um, and it is hard out here. Um, you know, but I, I, I want to move us a little bit um, and just thinking about some of the different sections of the book that I thought were really interesting. Um, there's a really particularly interesting section around automated vehicles. And um, that was quite a significant part of the Uber story here in DC. Um, and I don't think it ever materialized. I don't think they actually have any automated vehicles that are currently in operation here. Uh, but I'm curious if you could say a little bit more about just what that uh, meant here in DC. If you could say a little bit more about um, just why that's an important factor in what we can learn in terms of the history of that effort. 
Uh, so that was my obsession because, like, I, I historian well, kind of is, is my obsession. Yeah. Um, so I don't know if you saw last week. There's been a lot of pushback against the cruise vehicles in San Francisco. Yeah. Pushback. I mean, they set one on fire. But there's been lots of other things like <laughs> going on um, around automated vehicles. And uh, I like uh, bless you. I like. I was born in 1984. I I remember this show when I was a kid called Beyond the Year 2000. And there was always like flying cars in it. And I was like, yeah, like soon, any day. I counted down the days to the year 2000, and then it came. And I was just like, like, so disappointed, you know? And as years went by, I started reading more and more about it. And there's lots of really interesting books. And Peter Norton has one called Autonorama, where they talk about kind of like the promise of automated vehicles. And I think like legislating ahead of time was part of DC's like, um, it's a project to make itself a, a, a tech capital, right? So it, people pay attention to those things. It's good publicity, it's cheap publicity. You know, like little robots going around, they're really cute, and they bring people sandwiches or whatever, right? But as a solution to actual urban problems, so one of the things you mentioned in the book was this article where they're talking about these uh, starship technologies, the small little robots, like solving food desert issues, right? As if it was like an absent-minded thing that happened. We just put people over here and food over right. here, and right, right. robots will connect them. It's like, okay, maybe to some degree, but we could also just do low-tech solutions, you know, like grocery stores and buses and, um, and all these kinds of things. And so I think like, I think the broader term for this way of thinking, which I think we're all guilty of, not just the city, is like tech solutionism. The idea that technology has the answer to these problems, which we kind of see as profoundly political, not just technological. So I think ADs are part of that. I mean, yeah, it'd be great if we could just leave here and just get into a car that would drive you. We don't have to worry about it, all those kinds of things. But, you know, there's lots of low-tech solutions that work very well. Plus, what we really need is less cars on the road, right? <laughs> In the long term, yeah. whether they're electric or not, right? And so it, it just seems as like a short-sighted solution, but one that garners a lot of kind of good growth. I was like chicken little at work. I would say to my colleagues, it'll never happen there. Like, Look at this guy. Like he doesn't believe in technological progress, and I was like, I don't, I don't know, I just, I just don't think it's going to happen. And here we are, where it's like, you know, it may be a solution to something long term. I just don't, I, I you know, but yeah, climate change, all the different problems we face. It's quite clear that more vehicles, whatever they are, is not really. You know, we can say electric vehicles are great, but like, you know, my in-laws are from Argentina. Lithium mining is not clean either, right? And so, like, there's lots of things we can think about um, uh, that are much broader, and that AVs may be part of some solution, but um, they're definitely not a silver bullet to like urban issues more generally. Never mind what do we do with workers <laughs> um, or all these other kinds of issues, right? Um, uh, that are, are surrounded it. But yeah, I think. Uh, AVs are one to be highly skeptical about would be my but advice. But they were, yeah, they were very important for like enlisting kind of like support, right? It's like, this is pretty good. And I think investment too, right? Yeah. Like if you're thinking about plowing your money into something, you think like, I'll buy into that. Like there was a conference in DC in 2016, uh, or no, 2019, like Uber Elevate. So you could walk inside a kind of, um, uh, you know, a, a mock-up, not an actual one, but like a little uh, cockpit of like a, you know, a drone type copter and it's like, you know, you'll be able to fly around the city seamlessly, right? Um, but, you know, meanwhile, the reality is just potholes, right? Um, and all the other issues you face. So I think it, there's a, a huge gap between the promises of those technologies and the reality we live in. And I think that gap is like both persistent and like political. It's like really important for like shaping what we think the future of the city could be like. Declan, I really appreciate that that answer. Uh, you had me at a future with fewer cars. Uh, I'm with you on that. Um, Katie, you look like you had something to add there. I just wanted to see. You're good? Okay. Um, so, okay. I have been channeling my inner talk show host, and you know, I have one last question, but I really want to make sure we have time to get to the Q&A here. Um, and my hope was that this would sort of leave us on a note of hopefulness. Um, so hopefully we will get there in a way. Um, you know, there's a lot in this book uh, that analyzes and talks about the role that low expectations have played, um, low expectations of citizens and of policymakers and how that sort of shaped the story. Uh, but you conclude that expectations may be on the rise. Is there some hopefulness that you know, there will be some different way that people are thinking about and, and uh, setting their expectations for uh, the future? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Garen, I think one thing that feels really hopeful to us is this conversation. I was saying to Garen before that during the course of this work, I never could have imagined 
And I don't think five years ago it would have happened, and certainly not 10 years ago, that we would have been able to come and have a public conversation with a, with a bid, let alone the biggest bid um, president, and have a conversation to really think about how does Uber help us or hurt us? And so that feels hopeful to me. I also feel very hopeful about the number of actions we've seen from workers. It is kind of hot labor winter, maybe, still. <laughs> in terms of the labor movement and the role of gig workers and tech workers to raising um, flags about how they are treated. A colleague of ours, Vina Duval, has been able to get out in the public and talk a lot about what we call algorithmic wage discrimination, the idea that, as you guys might or might not know, two workers side by side will open their phones and get paid radically different amounts wow. for the same job. Right. So the old adage of equal pay for equal work has gone out the window. And the idea that that story is circulating feels so hopeful to me, in part because workers are also saying, you know what? That isn't fair. That isn't right. And I do deserve more. And so seeing February 14, just a few, a, what, a week ago, um, there was a global action. They were even DC now is on its third iteration. I'm going to give a shout out to Ace Collaborative, a project in Northern Virginia that is organizing mostly Bangladeshi Uber drivers. They had their third. Um, they are the third iteration of a DC group to organize gig workers, and they participated in that global day of action. I think at the national level, there are conversations about worker rights as well as data protection. There was exciting news in California this week around data rights and worker protection. So I think there's a conversation. Am I depressed about what happened in Minnesota last year? Absolutely. Sure. Declan, you want to add anything? First of all, I think your talk show is great. So <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, I think you're a great question. The, yeah, I think it's it's part of a broader reconsideration of like where we are more generally. And so you know, we talk about Uber or any other kind of company or Facebook or you know just a kind of Silicon Valley decade that we kind of all lived through. Um, you know, we're beginning to rethink like what that means, right? Our relationships with our phones, our relationships with each other, and how technology mediates all those things, and how it affects like democratic politics, right? Um, and so I feel hopeful in that sense that we've kind of gone through a decade and a half of that and there is like a, there feels to be some kind of shift in our in our evaluation of that yeah. um, and, and what it means um, and so you know we get things like 15 minute city which 20 years ago would have been kind of unimaginable as a conversation yeah. and, and so I, I do think like the, the coming problems are very large but also our awareness of them is beginning to kind of grow and there seems to be you know from a very low point we seem to be kind of building back up again Oh, one more thing I should give a shout out to is last year we excitingly um, added a 25 cent tax. I know it's only 25 cent, guys, but um, Council Member Brianne Nadeau added a 25 cent tax on all ride hail services in the DC area as a way you start to maybe try to refund Metro. Um, and I think that that kind of an initiative is significant, and I don't want to dismiss it. No, no. no. So, so to lead it that way, I think the real exciting, the, for me, the really exciting part about the gig economy question is the ability for it to ignite urbanists right now, environmentalists, as well as the labor movement. Awesome. Can we give a round of applause to our labor actors here? really been a rich discussion. I think we have enough time for Q&A. So Marin, I'm uh, new at this. So I don't know exactly how we do it. I'm going to turn it back to you. Okay. All right. All right. So we've got about 10 minutes for questions. Um, so I'll grab some folks. Um, and we're sorry we won't be able to get all of them. So I'll go up here first. Hello. Uh, thank you for your book. Okay. You can hear me? Okay. Thank you for being here and speaking. Um, so I just want to know, like, how are you, what in your book or what in your studies is making it clear that this is not the main issue? Like, I think that we were at the symptom of a bigger issue, systemic issue of inequality, um, including um, residents of some wards being also lobbyists against uh, improvements in affordability for residents in other wards that don't have the same access or contacts or capital resources to do that. So it's not, um, I think Uber is just found 
a way in where there's a lot of other problems already existing? Great question. I think that's exactly right. I mean, uh, uh, the 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 un, like we're geographers. The uneven nature of the city, right? DC, the inequality and how it plays out across the city. I think is really important to think about how Uber kind of works, right? Um, and I think in, in many ways, like the the pandemic brought home to many of us, kind of the the inequality of kind of the the delivery systems and not just Uber, but Uber Eats and, and all the other ones, DoorDash and so on and so forth, where we kind of have a city that increasingly gets divided into haves and have nots, right? Those who have time to sit at home and get deliveries brought and then those who do not who bring the deliveries, right? And so I think it, 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 and that's part of the idea of the book is to show how this kind of maps onto the broader kind of structural and racial inequalities and class inequalities within the city. Um, and it maybe offers itself as a solution to some degree, but perhaps in, in some some sense exacerbates some of those issues. But, kind of like, but you're but you're absolutely right. Like that's the what's it called? Cheat no, so that's the point. It is a symptom, right? We don't think it's like the sole thing that's you know forcing all this to happen. But we think it's a good way into trying to understand what's happening. Thank you. Uh, thank you for a wonderful book. I um, got it yesterday and I uh, read about two thirds already. Uh, it's very thank interesting, uh, just from an economic standpoint, and then you know, adding in what it's doing to Washington, D.C., and other cities. Um, I had a question. Uh, you touched upon it, Declan. Um, did you notice in your research that Lyft, DoorDash, other gig economy focused delivery companies had better behavior? Mm. Uh, in terms of you know, in terms of workers' rights, in terms of fairness, uh, in terms of not not from a technology standpoint, uh, but did uh, was there a mandate from other companies to treat their workers any better than what you know the common denominator of Uber uh, does? I love that question, and thank you for it. Um, at the outset in 2016, when we began surveying and interviewing workers, that is what we expected. And then subsequently, in you know the years, we kept expecting to find a difference in the quality of work for these different workplaces. Um, but what we have found over the years, whether it is in Instacart, is one of the worst, um, Lyft, Uber, DoorDash, Grubhub, GoPuff, um, apart from Alto, which just shuttered its DC offices, Alto was a ride hail, um, which did treat its workers differently, um, there is nearly no difference. However, some of the workers that we have surveyed and interviewed do believe that they are treated differently across the apps, depending on, let's say, if their battery is low, if they have other apps open. Um, some of them have figured out games, you know, particularly better in, on some apps than others. Um, but there's been no major distinction either about the working conditions of these apps or their lobbying behavior. And many of these companies have, um, what's it called, retained the same lobbyists over time. So it's like McDonald's and Burger King. Uh, I think basically. so. I think uh, it, it's something that's slightly different about the economy as well, is that most workers are actually working for all of those companies at the same time. Right. Yeah. And so they just flip between apps and, and try uh, you know, gain the differences between them. And so that's maybe something slightly different that they, the, you know, they're independent contractors technically who work for all these different things. And so they're used to this very you know, multitasking kind of uh, thing, right? which sometimes is alarming when you're sitting in the back of one, but um, they're very good at it. Which, feed, which feeds into what Uber says, these are independent contractors, and, and Lyft. These are independent contractors, we have no control over them, they have complete independence. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right, except for the fact that they have lost that argument abroad in all kinds of other national jurisdictions, and so we have to remember in the same way that the, what makes M&Ms? What's a company that makes Mars. Mars. So Mars in the EU, right, makes M&Ms without red dye too because they're required to, in the US, we have the red dye too for our kids. Okay, Uber in the UK, for instance, provides holiday pay. If you get killed, you get work, you get death benefits, workers' comp, right? These same companies, many of them operate very differently across different jurisdictional boundaries. And this is a very brief um, comment or question. Okay. I'm sorry, um, we're gonna have to move on to the next question. Sorry. Thank you. I'll ask afterwards, yeah. yeah. Actually, thank you for your talk. I actually d did want to hear you comment more actually about the workers assuming that risk um, so, and being classified as contractors and not employees. Yeah. 
Um, yeah, one of the first questions we asked workers when we sat down with them in 2016 was about whether or not they had ever um, had a salary or paid time off. And we also asked questions about union membership, but that went to the wayside as soon as we learned that many of these workers have been failed dramatically by the American labor market. So for them, the difference between a W-2 job at McDonald's, while they weren't going to be subject to financial risk or physical risk, right, was so difficult for their lives that Uber was an okay bargain to take. Right. For many of these workers, I think the way to understand the rise of Uber is in response to the American uh, uh, care crisis, a crisis of care. Many of these workers are caring for a dad who has dialysis, a kid who's got special needs. Right. They're trying to get themselves got, you know, to the doctor. Um, and it's really hard when you've had no rights in a workplace for a very long time to then look at Uber as somehow a terrible bargain because it offers the possibility of flexibility. It doesn't really guarantee it. Um, and there's a huge number of risks, but for many of these workers, it's an okay bargain um, at the begin, at the outset to take. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna, don't, don't throw tomatoes at me, but <laughs> my name is Claude Bailey. I was Uber's first lobbyist. Um, we tried to track you down, Claude. Yeah, you did? Face yeah. to face, finally. I, I don't know how you missed me. Uh, but I was Uber's first lobbyist. I was involved when the first legislation was passed. I was involved in all the conversations with Mary Jay's office, with Ron Linton, um, all those people. I worked directly with, I, I worked directly with Travis Kalanick. Uh, and it was quite an experience, I'll say. Um, I will say that I don't think a lot of the longer term implications of allowing Uber to operate were really considered. I mean, Uber's um, business model was go to the city, ask for forgiveness, mm -hmm. not permission. Mm -hmm. And then they would build up this loyal following of people who were so dissatisfied with the taxi system that they got them to lobby elected officials to do whatever needed to be done so that Uber could operate because they loved the Uber, they loved the Uber experience. Mm. They love the money they got. They start out spending tons and tons of money. They didn't spend. That's the truth. They, they, all right, but I will say, I will say that most of their early writers were part of the younger demographic in this city who had just come here, and they lobbied the council. I can tell you a couple of stories where a couple of council members email systems literally shut down because of the volume of emails that came in in support of Uber, which I think did put pressure on the council to act. I'll, uh, well, let me, I'll stop. We can talk. We can talk. Uh, yeah. uh, yeah. We would love to talk. We would love to talk. Uh, I'll voice. sound straight somewhat by pretty client privilege, but I'll talk. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you. Well, I think that's quite a way to end, unless you guys have any final words. That was the last let question, me, unfortunately. Yeah. I just wanted to say thanks to you, Marin, for hosting us, especially today when we found out that WAMU laid off 15 of yes. its staff um, unexpectedly and shuttered DCS. It makes me so thankful for spaces like this and programs like yours. Thank you so much for that, and thank you all for coming out. Um, I did want to give a special thanks to everyone who donated tonight. Um, if you donate to our programs, you keep our programs free, um, and there are a lot of ways to contribute to the DC History Center, including becoming a member, um, which starts at just $20, which is like really quite a bargain for a year, um, so I always like to hype that. I also like to thank um, Events DC and the DC Commission on the Arts and Humanities, who also support our programs, um, and to, of course, thank our speakers. This was an incredible conversation. 
them um, and to all of you for your questions. Um, I know we're going to keep the conversation going. Um, Declan and Katie are so generous as to sign some books out um, in Memorial Hall at the conclusion of the program. If you don't already have your own copy, you can grab one in our store um, along with some other DC related goodies. So I encourage you to take a look. Um, and you know, you might also catch our downstairs neighbor uh, with their own DJ set starting in just a couple of minutes. So there will be some music as well. Um, so one final thank you and round of applause for our speakers tonight. And thank you.